What if we could be like heroes in a fantasy and be accompanied by a fully customizable sidekick? A creature so complementary to our way of life that it offered a kind of superhuman partnership. A guardian whose senses were keener than those of a genius detective, a protector with speed and endurance beyond that of an Olympian, and a friend whose courage rivaled the bravest warriors. What if this companion kept us as playful as a child, even into old age, and just a little wild, even through the most refined routines? And what if, despite its endless gifts, it appeared to enjoy the partnership even more than we did? Where on earth would we find such a being? Among the monsters of the forest might seem the least likely place, but as it turns out, that is exactly where they came from. For these beings are no fantasy, and we need not be a hero to have them by our side, even though our dogs often make us feel like one. There is now a dog breed to complement every modern lifestyle. The official total, according to the American Kennel Club, is 190 recognized breeds. Dog diversity extends even further through the sheer number of individual canines now living among us. There are currently over 75 million dogs in the United States alone. From the tiniest five-pound terriers sternly enforcing our regiments of urban hustle and bustle, to the mightiest 200-pound mastiffs regally guarding our pastoral estates, the variety of dogs eager to join our ranks appears to defy the concept of a common ancestor. How can a purse-traveling Pekingese and a Special Forces German Shepherd descend from the same stock? The answer points to something well beyond their varied physical appearance, and it accounts for what has enshrined them as man's best friend all along. Dogs live for the people who keep them. Big and small, we now know that all dogs evolved from certain packs of prehistoric wolves that first sensed the potential power of a partnership. We've traced the diverse lines of evidence through the phylogenetic tree of dog evolution and found that all lead back to a long-lost legion of predators who transitioned from hunting us to hunting with us. But how did our ancient alliance with dogs overcome the prehistoric fear that separated us from wolves? How did we ultimately earn such protective friendship from what had long been the fiercest phantoms of our nightmares? I give you wolves to dogs, and how it began. It's nearly dusk but the sun's fading amber still illuminates a haze of cooking smoke that settled close to the ground about the camp. A dozen or so men and women move industriously through their evening routines, cleaning and mending and stowing their wares, while as many children run about with outstretched hands that skim along the tops of tall grasses. At every turn, the children stop and stare across the valley to make sure the wolves are still there, playing just like them. Reassured, they commence running and giggling. The coming night is never scary when the wolves are near, for the wolves, their parents tell them, are the tribe's protectors. Among this group of Stone Age people who lived some 35,000 years ago, no one can remember a time when the wolves weren't there, and everyone knows the story of why. The tribal elders have passed it down for generations, a cherished myth about the ancient days before the great truce, a dangerous age when the tribe feared the wolves, who would take their children away to consume their spirits. But then, the myth says, the spirits of the children inhabited the wolves, and made them long for the comfort of the tribe. 
So the wolves atoned for once hunting the children by becoming their protectors, and thus the great truce was made. For all time thereafter, the wolves would accompany the tribe to alert it to danger, assist in the hunt, and watch over its children. In return, the tribe would help feed the wolves and protect them too. When the sun's light fully fades and the stars blink into being overhead, the men and women call their children into the glowing shelters. Like every other night, it's time to allow the wolves to approach and feed on the scraps of the evening meal. But one child hesitates. He remains outside and keeps his eyes on a particular wolf he's observed for several days as it walks toward him at the edge of the camp. When only a few paces separate them, the wolf stops and looks up at the child. They hold each other's stare for several moments. The child decides to bring forth a piece of meat he's saved, and he tosses it forward. The wolf snaps it from midair. Just then, a man appears protectively by the child's side. At his approach, the wolf doesn't flee. It merely sits and lowers its head, maintaining eye contact all along. The child brags to the man about what he's just done and begs to give another piece of meat. As the man obliges and fetches another scrap, the wolf begins to wag its tail. The child takes the meat, moves even closer now, and follows the man's instructions to extend his hand toward the wolf with the meat on the flat of his open palm. The wolf eases its head forward slowly, ears back, and then gently takes the food. The man smiles. He and the child watch the wolf watch them for a moment or two longer before it finally turns and trots away. Gazing after it in growing reminiscence, the man tells the child about his father's favorite wolf, who used to feed from his hand just like that all the time. The child has now found his wolf companion, the man says. Not everyone is so lucky. Scenes and tribal stories something like this were actually starting to become common in locations throughout Eurasia at least 35,000 years ago. Back then, our ancestors were in the midst of a kind of cultural adolescence, in part as a response to an Ice Age thaw that unleashed new opportunities for migration, hunting, and gathering. The historical timing of our first friendly interactions with wolves, therefore, is unlikely to be coincidence. We had started experimenting with all kinds of new tools and lifestyles around then. Wolves were much more populous at that time. Tens of millions roamed the Stone Age world, compared to less than 250,000 that survive today. They were a ubiquitous presence among our Stone Age ancestors. We crossed each other's paths constantly. Whereas most large predators hunted at night, wolves and humans both hunted during the day, and we hunted the same kinds of animals. For thousands of years, we competed with each other on relatively even terms. But by 35,000 years ago, humanity had gained the upper hand as a suite of new technologies spread among the tribes, including the bow and arrow, and as more sophisticated cooperation empowered us well beyond our individual physicality. In the ensuing millennia, wolves would have to adapt more deferential behavior to survive in our presence. Although many humans certainly continue to fall victim to lupine violence, the inexorable trend was toward human domination. Birthing new litters every couple of years, wolves must have adapted relatively rapidly to this power shift. Many thousands of wolf generations would have spanned the comparatively brief phase of humanity's technological ascendance, providing a sufficient evolutionary window for new traits to accumulate that favored gentler human interaction. And the survival incentive motivating these adaptations was clear. In many cases, scavenging tribal trash would have offered at least as many calories as hunting, 
and for a lot less work. Getting close enough to scavenge put selective pressure on the wolves that took the risk. Aggressive wolves would be killed, docile wolves would be ignored or even welcomed with a bit of extra food. The social similarities between wolves and humans served these rendezvous well. Both species featured exceptional sociability within organized hierarchies. Among wolves, however, submissive males often fell victim to being outcast by their pack alphas. Submissive rather than predatory wolves, therefore, were the ones that most often ventured into human camps to scavenge in the first place. In that context, their submissiveness became an advantage as humans grew more fascinated than fearful in their unthreatening presence. Curiosity compelled people to more boldly interact with these wolves and experiment with their behaviors. And any encounters with wolf pups served only to accelerate the endearment. Welcoming and rewarding the tamest wolf lineages that scavenged among them, especially from puppyhood on, would have had a profound and rapid effect on both the temperamental and physiological development of these wolf populations. And to appreciate just how quickly these proto-domestications could have taken place, we turn to the results of an infamous Soviet-era experiment involving silver foxes. In the early 1960s, a Soviet scientist named Balayev began to selectively breed a captive population of silver foxes, which had been captured from the wild to support the fur trade, to see how long it would take to domesticate them. Balayev set up a feeding routine in which each fox would be carefully handled during hand feeding to provide a standardized opportunity to rate their aggressiveness and tameness. The foxes reached sexual maturity at only seven to 10 months of age, enabling quick generational turnover. And with each breeding cycle, Balayev let only the tamest 10% or so of foxes mate. After a mere 40 generations, a time span of less than 30 years, Balayev had not only produced a group of remarkably friendly foxes who hand-fed, wagged tails, and cuddled without hesitation, but he had inadvertently created an entirely new breed of fox displaying distinct physical differences from the wild population. Their ears had become floppy, their tails had taken on a curve, their muzzles had compacted, and their teeth had become smaller. Blood work revealed significant changes in their hormone levels as well. In short, the selectively bred foxes had become more puppy-like than their wild counterparts. Beyond just taming the fox, Belayev's true scientific revelation was that temperamental and physiological evolution were entangled in canines. Changes in one produced changes in the other. Were Belayev somehow able to continue his experiment for hundreds of years, let alone thousands, his foxes might have become completely unrecognizable, both in personality and physicality, from their wild ancestors. Human tribes 35,000 years ago that began cohabitating with scavenging wolf packs did not administer anything like Belayev's intensely focused breeding program. But what their manner of selection lacked in intensity, it made up for in duration. Belayev achieved significant tameness and morphological change in his fox population after only 30 years. Stone Age wolf enthusiasts, on the other hand, spent thousands of years killing the most aggressive wolves and ignoring or even cultivating the tamest ones. The evolutionary effects were just as dramatic. By around 30,000 years ago, the archaeological and genetic record suggests that the tribes living in modern-day China had selectively yielded a lineage of canines that looked and behaved very differently than the wild population of surrounding wolves. And it appears that the same thing was happening farther west in parts of modern-day France, Belgium, and Germany, where canine fossils and other archaeological evidence shows that something wolf-like 
but no longer quite a wolf, was accompanying humans. Wolf-to-dog domestication, it seems, was actually common. The caves of Eurasia are like time capsules that can perfectly preserve these ancient moments. In the depths of one of the most famous, located in France, there is a distinct track of footprints so undisturbed that they seem to have been altogether abandoned by time. For over 150 feet, the pristine tracks trace a 26,000-year-old moment in the life of a young boy and his dog. In the mud of the cave floor, their prints proceed together in a way that's obviously friendly. No one was running. No one was dodging or fighting. The boy and his dog were simply walking side by side into the cave. The cave was dark, and one of the best pieces of information illuminating that moment is a series of charcoal markings on the overhanging cave wall where the boy intermittently dragged his torch to light their way. Scientists radiocarbon dated those markings to hone in on its 26,000-year-old timeline. Perhaps the boy brought his dog along as his protector to guard against the ghosts of the cave's deep caverns. Whatever specifically motivated the canine companionship, it's clear that our historical friendship with the dog as we know it had already begun. Stone Age dogs that lived among us 15,000 to 30,000 years ago all tended to resemble a kind of wolf-shepherd-husky mix, and they all probably boasted a versatile set of helpful talents related to tracking and hunting game, as well as guarding and protecting campsites. Their superior senses of smell and hearing, along with their superior speed and endurance, dramatically enhanced our ability to secure food in such a way that the interspecies whole was greater than the sum of its parts. Dogs and humans together were disproportionately more powerful and secure than wolves and humans had been apart. And just as importantly, we made each other happier. Surges of oxytocin, the so-called love hormone, began to infect the brains of both humans and dogs when we made eye contact and embraced each other. This reinforced a cascade of associated physiochemical adaptations that attuned dogs to our facial expressions and body gestures, a marked difference from wolves, who rarely make any eye contact with us at all. As humans and dogs became ever more sensitive to each other's gaze and expressions, our bond was reinforced in a positive evolutionary feedback loop, which enabled increasingly complicated communication between us. By 10,000 years ago, the language that had emerged between dogs and humans grew extensive enough to ramify more specialized roles. With dogs' help, we domesticated our next species, goats. Sheep and pigs soon followed. As people began to more actively select for herding abilities in their dogs, new canine varieties with distinct temperamental and physical characteristics resembling modern-day Australian shepherds and border collies emerged by around 8,000 years ago throughout Central Europe and Asia. Meanwhile, in the desert scrublands of northern Africa, Long-distance sighthounds resembling modern-day salukis and greyhounds who were selected for vision, speed, and endurance well beyond wolves were bred to assist in long-range pursuits of deer and rabbits over wide-open terrain. The herding and agricultural revolution that these dogs helped initiate reliably produced an excess of food that significantly stratified society for the first time in history. Excess food meant excess wealth that strong men could hoard. Civilization was born, and along with it, the world's first wealthy ruling class. A new generation of kings and queens could afford to develop novel varieties of dogs that a thousand preceding generations of hunter-gatherers would never have dreamed of. 
spiritual and even purely entertaining canine varieties spread among royal families. Ceremonial burials and artwork featuring dogs followed and became ever more elaborate. Anubis, the famous dog-headed god of ancient Egypt who guarded the afterlife, dates to around 5,000 years ago, by which time Egyptian queens were breeding smaller and smaller companion dogs that started resembling modern toy breeds by around 3,000 years ago. A thousand years later, and on the other end of the spectrum, Roman generals were getting into the habit of recruiting the biggest and most courageous dogs of conquered territories to enlist as canine soldiers. They bred these war dogs to be fearless, so they would charge and break up enemy lines in advance of cavalry, infantry, and even archery volleys. Roman canines resembling modern mastiffs and oversized Belgian Melanois died by the thousands alongside their human handlers, and they were often honored with a degree of ceremony nearly matching the generals themselves. Across the Mediterranean world, no matter what new roles dogs were adapted to, every millennium to pass represented nearly a thousand dog generations, and with people now obsessively selecting for the particular traits they liked, canine variety practically exploded. For all of the world-shattering differences between them, Native Americans' encounter with Europeans 500 years ago featured at least one conspicuous commonality. They both had dogs. Indeed, by then, dogs lived among all human civilizations, from the Inuit of the Arctic to the Aborigines of Australia. Still, despite the ubiquity of dogs, the most varied and specialized canine populations in the world by 500 years ago were definitely found in Europe. Drawing upon the explosive diversity of dogs that had been established throughout the ancient Mediterranean world, Europeans of the Middle Ages had produced dozens of novel varieties, including spaniels and water dogs for hunting birds, collies for herding sheep, and poodles, both large and small, for domestic entertainment. This program of selective breeding only intensified as it became a defining feature of upper-class European naturalism in the centuries to come. Eventually, the privileged traditions of dog breeding were absorbed into the leisure activities of Europe's new industrial age middle class. In response, wealthy British, French, and German breeders sought to rescue the enterprise from its assumed degradation into amateurism by establishing official breeding standards as part of a new program of national kennel clubs. The British Kennel Club issued the first official stud book in 1874, which defined the specifications of 40 dog varieties thereby instituting the concept of a breed as we understand the term today. In the decades that followed, dozens of additional breeds from well beyond Europe would be inducted into Kennel Club's rosters as the ancient practice of selective breeding accelerated to keep pace with our diversifying desires for dogs' unique gifts. Since the very beginning of humanity's journey through this world, we've actively searched our environment for means to ensure our survival. But for our Stone Age ancestors, it was in the firelit eyes of the friendly wolves who approached them where they first beheld the glimmer of a cooperative command of the world. Early in the partnership, there appear to have been ebbs and flows in dog domestication in several areas around the world, where once domesticated packs drifted back into the wildness from whence they'd come for additional centuries or millennia before resettling with humanity once more. Such overlapping evolutionary paths have made it difficult for us to decipher the exact history of wolves to dogs, but the bones of the story have nonetheless been unearthed. By 30,000 years ago, dogs and humans had formed a permanent companionship, 
And since then, we've learned to lean ever more heavily upon their extraordinary talents. For all of its unprecedented power, modern technology continues to fall short of the countless powers of canines. Our dogs can smell early stage cancer with up to 98% accuracy. They can sense oncoming seizures in epileptics and hypoglycemia in diabetics. They steward the handicapped through cities and they remind the mentally ill to take their medications. They ease the post-traumatic stress of our warriors even as they assume the mortal burdens of war themselves. But beyond their diversified physical gifts, it was always the undaunted devotion to us that defined the lineages we kept. Through the deep history of our mutual domestication, we've lived for the dogs who would die for us.